All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see those of you here. I know we got some people in the entryway coming on in, so I'll give them a quick second. We'll get rolling in just a minute. How's everybody doing? Yeah, good. Drive safe when you came in. A little slippery out. Okay. How about for the newcomers who are just here? How was the drive for you guys? Wet, sloppy? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that was about mine early this morning, you know, like 6.30 is when I was on the road. And 94, fortunately, was pretty clear. So that was good. 94 was good. So if you came in that way, um, that was a pretty good drive. So here's what I will start off by doing. If you could take... If you want to take more than one for your household, feel free. There's a lot on this, so don't, don't get freaked out. Um, take one for your household and kind of pass it around. <coughs> Excuse me. I invite you guys to hang on. We can print more of these, but hang on to that throughout the duration of, of Revelation. Because um, that, as you will see, that is in like an art, you know, kind of artistic way the kind of structure of the entire book of Revelation. And so if you look at it, you're like, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. It, it's meant to be like, what is happening? And as we go through it, it'll begin to make more sense. But, but that I have found to be a very handy way to kind of think about what's the overall structure of Revelation. Um, Chelsea, did you get one when you came in? Great. Um, so take one or, or, or a couple for your household. Hang on to that. If you ever lose it, because um, I lose all my hard copy paper stuff. Uh, if you want an electronic copy, I can send that to you. You just got to email me. Thanks, Chloe. You just got to let me know. Um, I want to make sure that everyone's got it. I'm going to put... Have you take one of these. There you go. Again, this is uh, something we'll kind of reference on and off again as we go through the book of Revelation. And then, Emily, take one for you and Bob. If you guys want another one, you can. No. And Lynn, you, you can share. So I give that to you, but I'm breaking one of the first rules of, of teaching. I'm going to ask you to not look at it right now. <laughs> but I wanted to at least hand it out at the beginning. But just kind of tuck that off to the side. And then, if you have your Bible with you, you can take it out. Um, if not, we have Bibles on the back row back there. You definitely want to have them um, as we kind of journey through this. But today we start off going through, um, we're actually going to be in this probably about three months, just so you guys know, three months of going through the book of Revelation. Um, so get ready, all right? Uh, have your questions at the ready as we kind of go through it. But what we're also doing is, the sermons on each Sunday are also going to be talking about it. Sometimes the scriptures will line up with like the Bible study and the sermon. There's a couple of them that won't. We'll kind of get ahead of it in the sermon a little bit, and we'll kind of catch up in the Bible study. Because for Bible studies, just so you guys know, I'll remind you this again. We'll send it out news and notes. We have Bible study today. Next Sunday we have Bible study. But then we have three Sundays of no Bible study. Um, December 12th, we have no Bible study because we have the Christmas program, and so that will be going on at 9.45 right here. We encourage you all to come. Um, at, on December 19th, we're having our voters meeting, so if you are a member here at Peace, come and be a part of that, so that's on December 19th. And then December 26th, we're not having a Bible study because i got to be honest, guys, I'm going to be pretty beaten because <laughs> we got a gauntlet of services. Friday, Christmas Eve services. Saturday, we'll have Christmas Day worship come on out for that. We'll have communion in that service. And then the 26th, we'll have one service at 10 a.m. Um, that one, we haven't announced this yet, but you guys get the first, first kind of sneak peek. Wear your ugly Christmas sweaters if you want um, on December 26th. And if you want to bring some cookies and treats to share, we'll have some time of fellowship after the service as well for that. So it'll be a fun morning out. Um, it'll be kind of a low-key Sunday, but there won't be Bible study that Sunday. So we have this week, next week, and then three weeks off of adult Bible study, and then we resume, what's that, January 2nd or 3rd, whatever that first Sunday in January is. 
All right? And then if you guys can do a fair... That way I don't need to walk around. Pass these back to make sure people get one. All right. So with all that being said, we are going to start with Revelation. And this first one, we're going to talk a little bit about like Revelation as a whole, some key things to know as you read it, as you approach it. Because if you didn't know, there's a lot of questions and a lot of confusion around this book of the Bible, which is part of the reason why I was like, you know what, let's tackle this. Let's look at this at the sermons and on Bible study. And what better time than right before Christmas, you know, where we can look at Revelation and uh, look at this. But um, we're going to spend time going through this. So today we're going to look at some of the overview of Revelation and we're going to look at um, a little bit of chapters 1 and chapters 5, just so you guys know what our plan is for today. So to start, who, does anybody know who wrote the book of Revelation? And it's, Reve, no, it's Revelation. Sometimes we call it, oh, the book of Revelations. There's one Revelation. So it's a singular book of Revelation. It's kind of one vision, one kind of thing that that the author was given from God. So who wrote Revelation? Who knows that? So it was by one one author. Yep, one author. I heard John. Yep. So John, uh, there is some question of which John. There's like two Johns that people think of. Most people think it's the John that everybody knows. What other books of the Bible did the Apostle John write? Gospel of John, John 1, 2, and 3. That's exactly right. <laughs> so he did a lot of writing. And so he did a lot of writing, and a lot of the New Testament um, is his writing. And so as you read through Revelation, you'll see um, it's a very different book than his gospel, but you'll see some themes come up over and over again in Revelation and then in First, Second, and Third John. Um, who, does anybody know who it was written for? Because again, when you look at the New Testament and you look at the letters, um, which is what this section is, um, they're always written to someone. Does anybody know who the book of Revelation was written for? Yeah, Jeff. You are right. There are seven churches in kind of the province of Asia. It's kind of like modern day, like Turkey, um, that kind of region. And so that is, if you look in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, there are these letters written to these seven churches, and seven churches are listed by name. Presumably, this is who it was written for. Um, (coughs) Excuse me. I was eating some some peanuts. Sometimes it gets stuck in your throat. And it was written for these churches. Now, we are not going to be reading the section where it talks about the letters of those churches. We're actually going to be skipping that part. Um, We're jumping right to the juicy stuff, the stuff that that most people kind of like think about when they think about the book of Revelation. Um, But there are those letters in chapters 2 and 3 written to these churches, and they kind of call out um, the situation that was going on in their churches, but also written for us as a whole. Uh, Just so you guys know, we believe it was written about 95-ish is kind of the year it was written. So towards the end of John's life, um, presumably he wrote this when he was exiled on the island of Patmos. Um, He was telling people about Jesus and starting churches, and local governments were like, we got to get rid of this guy, and so they exiled him to the middle of an island. And so he lived there for a number of years, and it is presumably on this island where he receives this vision from Jesus where he writes down in the book of Revelation. What would you say is the purpose of Revelation? When you think about it, what do you think the purpose of John writing it and that God giving it is? Okay, so John's view into heaven, yeah. What other thoughts you've had or other people have said? Okay, give hope to people. Why would people need hope? That may seem like a weird question, but... But why would people need hope that John is writing to? Okay. Yep, so presumably if John's being exiled for being a follower of Jesus 
and telling people about Jesus, presumably Christianity is not exactly well-liked. And so they, they kind of need hope in the midst of that. Cool? Any other thoughts? What, why, is, why do we have Revelation? Why was it given? Okay, so there's a, there's a future reality to it, what to look for, okay? Any other thoughts? Okay, so yeah, so bring in, so looking at the Old Testament, kind of tying things together. Yeah, that's actually a really good point and something that, that not many people realize when you read the book of Revelation. If you read the book of Revelation, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but there are hundreds of references or allusions to the Old Testament. So if you read through the book of Revelation and there's some weird language, chances are it's actually referring back to something from like Daniel or Ezekiel or Jeremiah or somewhere in the Old Testament, and John isn't coming up with it. But it's actually language from the Old Testament. So if you really want to know Revelation, know your Old Testament. And that's really like the big thing that John emphasizes, is nothing he shares is new, which dispels, I think, some myths around Revelation is that it's actually nothing new that he's revealing. There are some aspects that he's kind of fine-tuning, but everything John talks about, you can find in the rest of the Bible, which is kind of like blows our mind a little bit of like, really? Um, There's a perception that Revelation is all new, but actually he's bringing up things that people of God have already been told in one way, shape, or form. Cool. Cool. A couple things I had written down for, like, why, why is this letter in the New Testament? Why did John write it? Why did God inspire him to do it? One, and this is the, the number one reason, um, to encourage Christians in every age. So the people who heard it first, to you and me, everybody in between, and every Christian that would ever come after us, to encourage us in every age who, who must suffer, whether it's greatly or in small ways, for our faith and allegiance to Jesus. So that fundamentally, I think, is the number one reason John wrote that for his people and why God has given it to us, is for those of us who have followed Jesus, who face hardships, um, whether that be from outside forces, whether that be from our own sin, whether that just be like terrible things happening, it's meant to encourage us in the midst of that, no matter what we're facing. So that's the number one thing. The second thing, and and you'll kind of get this in the sermon if you were here this morning, you heard this, um, it's to kind of unveil the reign of God, the rule of God, as he is the the lamb upon the throne. And so really, Revelation, you're going to see that theme all throughout, is this unveiling, which that's what apocalypse means, by the way, is unveiling to reveal. Um, It doesn't mean the end of the world. (laughs) We often think apocalypse means the end of the world. It just means unveiling. Think about the Wizard of Oz. You pull the curtain back, and you see who the guy really is. Revelation is doing that. It's pulling the curtain back and showing you what's really going on now and what's going to come in the future. But fundamentally, it's showing us that God is in control, that God, the the Lamb of God specifically, is on the throne. Uh, Thirdly, it shows us our, our future hope. So there is that future aspect to it. But believe it or not, the book of Revelation, if you look at like percentage-wise, it actually doesn't spend as much time talking about the future as you would think. See, Revelation is much more about showing us what's going on now in our present reality, and then it points us to what is coming. It definitely talks about the future, but not as much as we think. I think Oftentimes we think it's like 90% future, 10% like our life. Um, but I would actually say it may not be the, the exact inverse of that, but I would say at least 75% of the book, at least, is about our present reality or stuff that has happened in the past. It's like 75% of the book. So knowing that going into it, it helps shape how you approach 
the Bible. And lastly, believe it or not, the Re book of Revelation is a missionary book. Uh, because what is meant to show us is us as Christians, this is what's really going on. And this is the future hope we have. And unfortunately, it also shows us in stark and vivid language. Here's the future of those who reject the Lamb of God. And, and it's meant to be a, an encouragement to us of saying, man, this is really important. Like, this is really important. It unveils what's going on behind the scenes of our daily lives and seeing the deep spiritual meaning to everything in our lives. And fundamentally, the message of Jesus going out to everybody. And so it encourages us and shows us that that's our primary focus. As, as followers of Jesus, our focus is sharing the gospel and, and telling people about who he is. And so those are a number of things that I thought of as well. Now, um, if you guys were in the sermon, you know the answer to this, but what genre of literature, which if you didn't know, the Bible is made up of a number of different types of literature. So like when you read a, like a history textbook in your American civ, civ class, and then you read Shakespeare in your English class, you read them differently, right? At least I hope you do. Same thing with the Bible. There's different types of literature in this book. And so you read the book of Psalms differently than you read the book of Romans, which is a letter. The book of songs, Psalms were songs and prayers. You read them differently. They're both true, but you read them differently. So what genre is the book of Revelation? And again, if you were here in the early service, you already know the answer, so you can shout it out if you want, if you remember. Yeah, Jeff? So I heard apocalyptic. What were you going to say, Jeff? Well, yes. So, yeah. So, specifically Jewish apocalyptic literature, which is a very specific category. And so that is the genre, is apocalyptic literature. There, I'm going to show you a video. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah. Well, I, think I, it, I, I wouldn't pit it against one another. Of like, I would say it's a yes and. Yes, like people who know their Old Testament are going to see things in Revelation like, oh, I recognize that. I, I remember that from Exodus. I remember that from Daniel. And, and they'll know that. And where the Gentiles they'll kind of have to play catch-up, which honestly for us, we have to play catch-up. Like that's what makes it so confusing to us is we don't grow up knowing the Old Testament. I, I would say this, even as Christians, as much as we should. We often think the Old Testament, ah, we don't need to focus on that. It's actually, no, that's God's Word and our history. Um, so yeah. Yep. All right. What time we got? 10.04? All right. I think we can cover enough ground. See, here, here's the thing I'm going to run into each week, and I know it. There's so much. There's so much in this book, and we're going to scratch the surface. And so if you have questions we don't get to, or I kind of have to punt, and we have to kind of work around, please like write them down and let me know, and we'll grab coffee, or, or we'll sit down and talk, and I would love to talk to you more, or you bring it up at a future lesson, because we're going to be moving pretty quickly through the book, and we're not even going to... like scratch the surface, so to speak, of all the things we could. But I really want to show you this because it's a very helpful video, at least to me. I'm going to show a video that unpacks what apocalyptic literature is. It's a group done, it's done by a group called The Bible Project. Same group that made this. If you did not get a handout, let me know because this is like your cheat sheet to the, the overview of Revelation. Um, and as we go through it, it'll begin to make more sense. So I'll play the video for you guys as we dig in. It's the end of the world. The moon turns to blood, mountains crumble, mutant locusts swarm. These are just some of the strange images we find in parts of the Bible called apocalyptic. And while most people think the biblical word apocalypse means the end of the world, it actually doesn't mean that at all. 
So let's talk about how to read apocalyptic literature in the Bible. So wait, the apocalypse doesn't mean the end of the world? No. Apocalypse is a Greek word that means to uncover or reveal. An apocalypse is when you suddenly see the true nature of something that you couldn't see before. Because I don't always see things the way they really are. Right. We all develop familiar ways of seeing the world that can limit or blur our vision. So an apocalypse is like a revelation. Right. Now, in the Bible, an apocalypse is when God pulls back the curtain to show someone what's really going on in the world from a divine perspective. For example, take Isaiah the prophet. He's suddenly transported in a vision into God's throne room. Oh, right. He's in God's temple, described as a bridge between heaven and earth. And there, God gives him a divine perspective on Israel's past, present, and their future. So that Isaiah can bring challenge and comfort to God's people in his own day. Or think about the Apostle Paul, who was trying to stop the movement of Jesus, but then he gets stopped in his tracks by a vision of the risen Jesus himself. Yeah, he realizes that he's fighting against the very thing that he's been hoping for, and it changes the course of his life. So these apocalypses give people a heavenly perspective on their earthly situation, and they can give hope, or they can challenge you. Or make you change everything. Now, those are biblical stories about people having an apocalypse. There are also whole sections of biblical books where a prophet describes extended apocalyptic dreams and visions. People call this apocalyptic literature. And reading these dreams and visions is difficult. I mean, they're filled with strange images. Like, let's take Daniel. He sees ferocious beasts coming up out of a dark sea, trampling people on the land. And then a character called the Son of Man is exalted to rule the world. What is going on? Yeah, apocalyptic literature is written in a poetic, imaginative style, and it's packed with symbolism. How can I know what these symbols mean? Well, first, by studying the rest of your Bible. Apocalyptic imagery is based on biblical design patterns that begin in the book of Genesis and then develop throughout the Bible. Like the chaotic sea in the first sentences of the Bible that God tames but doesn't eliminate as he orders creation. And so the sea becomes an image of danger, death, and cosmic chaos. Ah, and the dry land, which comes out of the sea, is the safe, ordered place where humans are supposed to rule as God's image. Yes, and also on the land are beasts that humans are supposed to oversee. But keep reading, and the humans are deceived by a beast. And start acting like violent beasts. Exactly. Now. Sometimes a prophet will tell you what a symbol means. Like in Daniel, we're told those beasts symbolize violent human kingdoms. But more often, the authors just assume you know how to trace an image through the biblical story to understand its meaning. Now let's look at the last book of the Bible, the Revelation, because it's one really long vision. The whole thing is an apocalypse. Yeah, and it works the same way. It begins with John the visionary transported to God's throne room where he sees the risen Jesus as the exalted king of the world. But Jesus is depicted as a bloody lamb. Right. It's a design pattern showing how Jesus is the sacrificial lamb from Israel's Passover and from the Day of Atonement. He gave his life for the sins of the world. And then John sees the ultimate beastly dragon, that spiritual power that energizes violent earthly empires. It's cast out by Jesus, the world's true king. Yeah. Now that reminds me. When I read the Revelation, I'm struck by all this cosmic destruction and violence. I mean, it happens over and over and over. Yeah, in the Revelation, there are three seven-part cycles of God's judgment. And it's another design pattern that connects together the stories of the flood, the 10 plagues on Egypt, and the exile to Babylon, and even more. These are moments when humans unleash so much violence and death into the world that God hands them over to self-destruction. It's like a reversal of creation in Genesis chapter 1, as God allows the world and humans to sink back into darkness and disorder. That's sobering. It is. But remember, in Genesis 1, God overcame darkness and chaos with his light and life. And so too in the Revelation. The death of Jesus and the death of the world as we know it is the pathway into the renewed creation 
that began with the resurrection of Jesus. And so while the revelation feels like the end of the world, it's actually about the beginning of the renewed world, where heaven and earth are reunited and God's human images rule all creation in the love and power of God. Okay, this is a lot to take in. It is. And there's a lot in these books that is still hard to understand, but the purpose of apocalyptic is really clear. To give us a heavenly perspective on our earthly circumstances so that every generation of God's people can be challenged, comforted, and given hope for the future. All right. Any questions or comments? It's like drinking from a fire hose, I know. No questions or comments. Yeah? Yeah, that's good. Good. I'm glad it was helpful. Thanks, Todd. <laughs> yep. And again, it kind of, yeah, yep. Yeah, so you, you brought up the, um, the kind of sequ- sequence of everything, and you, you read my next bullet point. You exactly, you're exactly right. You kind of bring up how do you read um, Revelation in particular, like knowing that like, this is kind of apocalyptic literature, which kind of highlighting symbolism. Imprint that in your brain. Symbolism, 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 because there's going to be a whole lot of it. Like, it is chock full. And again, symbolism referring back to the Old Testament specifically. That, that's where they draw a lot of their symbolism from, is what is the story that has happened and, and kind of telling us in this way of what is really going on and, and pointing to what our future hope is in Christ. But in that video you saw, and what you talk about in the sermon, Jesus, like you see Jesus and he's a lamb who's been bloodied and even that is full of so much symbolism and so much meaning and we'll kind of dig into that in a little bit in chapter 5 but circling back to like how you read the book of Revelation. How many of you when you open up a book you start at chapter 1 and say there's 10 chapters in the book you're like great I'm going to read in chapter 1 and I'm going to read to chapter 10 and it's going to tell one story in a line together. How many of you that that's the assumption you make? Yeah, most of us, and we're Westerners, that's how we tell stories. By and large, that is our default way of telling stories in a, is in a linear fashion. If you read Revelation and you expect it to be a linear, straight story, you're going to be really confused, and it's going to lead you down some, some unhelpful paths. Because yes, you're exactly right. Revelation is written where, I think I have it, where do I have it written down? Uh, I have it written down, I think it's in a future lesson. Um, Basically, the end of the world, if you read Revelation, the end of the world happens like seven times at least. But if you just read it and you're like, this is a linear story from chapter 1 to chapter 22, it's going to tell me one linear story, the world ends seven times at least. Now, what you see is it's cyclical. How many of you have heard that word cyclical before? That is the nature of the book of Revelation, where um, it will tell you about an unfolding event, and then it'll start over again, and you have to be paying attention to know that that's what's going on. And so, for instance, they mention in the video, there's like these seven cycles of God's judgment, um, that's what oftentimes people focus on, like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the seven bowls, um, the seven trumpets, all that stuff. That are, and we'll talk about that more next week because that's actually what's coming up next week. Those are three separate cycles telling the same thing. And so if you read that thinking this is going to tell one linear story, you're going to be like, oh dang, there's judgment and the world ends. Oh dang. There's more judgment and the world ends again. And you know, so you, it can lead you down reading it in a way that John didn't write it. 
And so understanding, and that's why, aha, you have these handy sheets. Because if you look at it, the font is small, I get it. You may need the magnifying glass, I get it. But really just want to highlight to you this, that as you read it, you see on the left-hand side, you see chapter 1 through 3 and 4 through 5. That's pretty straightforward of telling one progression. But then it's when you hit chapter 6 through 16 specifically, where you see there's like four separate lines. We'll talk more about that as we read through Revelation. But what that is describing is four separate times at least, like three or four times, it's narrating the story of Jesus' ascension when he went to heaven and when he returns. And it's telling the same story from different points of view. Does that like make sense? Not that you understand this whole thing, but does that concept of telling the same time period from multiple points of view, does that make sense right now? All right, we'll unpack that more in the future weeks, but that is how we read Revelation. That is how we approach Revelation, is we kind of understand how is this thing structured? Um, Because there are specific things that aren't meant to be chronological, but are meant to show us the same thing over and over again to teach us something and to show us something. I have the quote there at the end of the video. I think this is a very good kind of helpful kind of summary, not just on the book of Revelation, but on apocalyptic literature in general. Um, Anytime it kind of gives us an apocalypse in this literature, it's a heavenly perspective on our earthly circumstances. So again, that can refer to the future, but it very much is concerned with our present lives. It's a heavenly perspective on our earthly circumstances so that every generation of God's people, so people of John's day, you and me, anybody in the future, we can be challenged, comforted, and given hope for the future. Any questions on that or comments? Yeah, Ted. So, so Ted, he brings up the, there's a teaching, hey, Scripture is simple enough and straightforward enough that it's not like you have to have a, a master's degree from seminary to get the basic message. And I would say it's still very much true um, that you can get the basic message of the Scriptures. Now, I will say this, that doesn't mean every book of the Bible is equally understandable. But you can understand the basic message, even if you just read through Revelation, the basic message is this, Jesus wins. And that's the fundamental message. Now, when you start getting into symbolism, that's when it's like, hey, you need the church, you need people kind of coming together and looking at this from a variety of perspectives and not just kind of a single kind of interpretation. So I would still say yes, but that, that teaching would say, do you get the basic message of the whole Bible? And I would say that you, you, you still very much do. But every book of the Bible, uh, this is why Book of Revelation, I don't recommend people who are new to the faith. Um, I, I, I don't recommend they just kind of dive into it because it can lead to a lot of confusion. And so it's good to be doing this in community with one another. So yeah, yeah Jeff? So, uh, in a sense, yeah, you could look at it that way of, hey, the four gospel writers, they're telling their perspective on the story of Jesus. And so, in a way, you could kind of say that. I would say the difference in this is this is one author. This is John. 
and he's being shown different visions that show the different perspectives of the same thing. So in a sense, you could say that, but it's slightly different. Does that answer your question? Okay, fair enough. All right, cool. So that's kind of overview of the kind of apocalyptic literature. I'm looking at time. Here is what we're going to do. We're going to real quickly, Revelation 1, kind of open up there. We'll go quickly through here, and then we'll try and spend a little bit more time on 5. What we'll do in Revelation 1 is I'll kind of highlight some stuff in verses 1 through 8. We're not going to read 1 through 8 right now, but if you have it open, you can kind of see what I'm referring to. Um, What you see in verse 1 is this, that even though John wrote it, he's not the source of this. So John didn't make it up, but what you see from the very beginning, the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. So this is very fundamentally from the very beginning. Jesus himself is the source of this. So, so God is, is speaking to John. He's inspiring him to write these words. And so John is simply the messenger of this. And as you kind of read through Revelation, it just talks about, hey, I was carried away or I was shown this or it was revealed to me this. And it's kind of like he's kind of in like a roller coaster, so to speak. And he's just kind of going along for the ride and he's just seeing all this different stuff. And Jesus is like, write it down. Write it down. Write what you see down. Um, but the source of all of this is not John, but it's Jesus. Uh, if, if you look in verse 3, he talks about how, you know, you know the, the, uh, the time is near, and it talks about this, this crisis that might be coming. A lot of people kind of wonder, like, well, what crisis is this referring to? What, like, a chain of events is this referring to? And there's a whole lot of different answers people can give. Most likely, um, thinking about John's situation, it's the persecution Um, that's happening. Um, Dionysius, if you guys know your Roman emperors and whatnot, um, he did not like the Christians at all. And actually during like the, the, you know, during the the falling of Rome and all that kind of stuff, the Christians were blamed for that. And so there was a lot of persecution against them. And so in a sense, Revelation in this immediate context was written for, hey, things are about to get really bad. Things are bad, but they're going to get really bad. And so we're giving you this message to comfort you and give you hope in the midst of that. Then it mentions in, you know, this, we talked about the seven churches. Anybody want to take a guess? Why, why seven churches? Why not 20, 30, 100? Why seven churches? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, so, so these were kind of well-known churches. That's probably the case. Any other thoughts? Why seven churches? Why is he writing a letter to seven? Hey, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, so again, this kind of speaks to some symbolism. Is seven is, a, if you didn't know, it's a really big number in the Bible. How many days did it take God to make all things? Seven. Even though we're like, well, it only took him six days to make things, but he rested on the seventh. And so seven is a symbol for completeness and wholeness and perfection. More than that, seven is four plus three, which you're like, well, duh. But... What, what that stands in for, 4 plus 3, and you'll see this pop up again as we continue reading, um, 4 plus 3, it means that it is over all of creation. That, that is, is symbolic of being authority over all of creation. And so really, why they chose 7, and why kind of it's like, hey, write this letter to 7 churches and not like all of them, or not like 20, is because this is meant to say this letter is for all churches, it's not just for these seven, but it's for all churches. And you see that in that symbolism of seven. Like I said, there's a lot of time. We're going to get to chapter five now, so I'm skipping nine through 20. You should read nine th- verses nine through 20. It's really cool, and you'll see some pictures of, of Jesus and his power. Um, but we'll jump to number five, 
Revelation chapter 5. We will read this section together. So I'll go ahead and read verses 1 through 5 for us. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven and on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Okay. Comments, questions on these first five verses? Okay, so seven pops up again. Where do you see seven? Seven seals. Okay. Yeah, so pretty significant again. Seven popping up again. Now, why do you think it matters that there's seven, seal, seven seals on this scroll? Why do you think that's significant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's going to be applicable to pretty much all of creation. And more than that, when you seal something, when soul, sc- scrolls were sealed, you would need to like break them open. And, and so having seven on there means this, that, that you really need somebody powerful to break those open. Because it's showing this is like unpenetrable. This is like the most secure thing you can imagine because there's seven scrolls on this. And that's what, as you read through verses 1 through 5, like John is weeping, and he's like, nobody can open this scroll. Nobody can open this. Any other thoughts? Todd, did you have something that stood out? Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, I think, so you mentioned the right hand, and, and that's significant. What, where have you guys heard that term, right hand, before in the Scriptures? Okay, yeah, so, so Jesus sits on the right hand of God. We confess that, like every week in the Creed. sits at the right hand of God the Father. And, and as you read this, it says, I saw seated on the throne the one of him who was seated, which, again, Old Testament, an allusion to the book of Daniel, where Daniel was given a vision of the throne room of God, and he sees this glorious one sitting on the throne who has all power, and oftentimes the Old Testament talks about the power of God being in his right hand. So if you read through the Old Testament, you'll hear that phrase over and over again. So in a sense, the fact that the scroll is in this person, his right hand, it's showing this, that this is authoritative over all things. And then, Todd, you bring up the significance, which we'll get to in the next couple of verses of, of ultimately Jesus being worthy of that authority, of that scroll. And so, very significant. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff. Yep. Yeah, so, so you, you kind of imagine you've got big, long scrolls, you roll it all up, and then you put the seals like over the point where it would start to open. I mean, as you go through, that's kind of how it plays out. But again, imagery only goes kind of so far if you start trying to, like, apply it to our physical world. But yeah. Yep. So then who is worthy to open it? Well, does it say Jesus? Look at Revelation 5, specifically verse, um, verse 5. But does it say Jesus' name? What does it say? Yeah, Lion of Judah, Root of David, which those, again, Old Testament, should be kind of going off in your mind. Those are two of the Old Testament names for the coming Messiah. So through the tribe of Judah, which Judah is one of the 12 sons of Israel, 
of, uh, of Jacob. And God told his people, hey, my Savior's going to come through the light of Judah. And so that's where this line of Judah comes in. And then also the root of David, which is in reference to King David. And if you look in 2 Samuel, there's a promise given to David and to all of God's people. Hey, David, in your line, there's going to come a king greater than you who will have an everlasting kingdom, who will be the king of all kings, and it's going to come from your your line. And so the writer's saying, and the revelation saying, this is what John is hearing, is that this guy has come, and this guy is here. But notice, that's what he hears. And now let's go ahead and let's continue. Let's read verses 6 through 4. Yeah, John, do you have something real quick? Yes. You are correct. Until the lion triumphed, that the seals were closed. What's the obvious? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's what it's getting at, is yeah, that, that what, whatever this lion did, that's the thing that was needed to begin to open up the scrolls and to begin to open up this plan that has been hidden up to this point. I think that's exactly the point it's making. So then we'll continue with 6 through 14. So he hears about this lion, and then he turns, and starting in verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the world. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation." And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. So, let me ask you this. What is being described here? In this section, verse 6 through 14, what is being described So you think second coming of Christ? Okay, any other thoughts? Okay, so, so it's kind of the, that Jesus is above all, he's sovereign, he's in control, okay? All right, so now he's taking his rightful place after having your DM. So when would you kind of place that on a timeline? Okay, death and resurrection. There's one, other, there's one other thing after the resurrection. Ascension, yeah. So I would say this. This scene is Jesus' ascension into heaven. Jesus, after having lived, died, risen again, and as we confess, is seated now at the right hand of God the Father. What is being described? The Lamb of God sitting down at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, where he is in control, he is sovereign, he is over all things, and he has conquered, and he has begun now to open the seals. So you guys see in the picture that's being painted is Jesus now. This is describing Jesus' ascension. Now, let me ask you this. Where's the lion, though? We heard about this lion. Where is the lion? 
It's, it's the lamb. I think that's the, the right way of putting it. It's like we hear, oh, this lion is coming, and then what John sees and what we see isn't a lion, but it's a lamb. And it's unexpected. It, it takes us back a little bit, but, but that's the nature of Jesus, isn't it? That the Messiah came, and that's fundamentally what got him killed, is he came, and they were expecting a mighty warrior uh, someone who would kick the Romans out and start an earthly kingdom, but what did they get? They got a savior, but they got, they got a guy born to a poor family who, who was a carpenter who, in a stable. He was an itinerant preacher. He just went around from town to town and preached about this kingdom of God. And he told people that he was God. And they killed him for it. And God's point is this, that that is the Savior. And so this image of this lamb who was slain, who was sacrificed, but is now alive, that's the victory that we have through this Jesus, who is not what we expect, who conquered and won for us in a way that we would never have chosen, but that's exactly what happened. Now again, you guys noticed seven showed up a few times, right? Yeah. So seven, like this lamb isn't just a normal lamb. He's got like seven eyes. What is he? I'm trying to like, he's got seven eyes, seven horns, seven spirits. Again, imagery meant to show um, all authority and wisdom and power and, and for all people. That's kind of what those sevens are showing us. The seven eyes, all seeing, all knowing. The, the seven, uh, what is it? Seven horns being all powerful. Horns were a symbol of authority. So having seven of them meant you were, had the most authority. You could see all things and you had control over all things. And then in verses 9 through 10, what is the cause for them singing out? What's the cause for it? For them singing this new song? What's that? Okay, so the ascension. But what did that mean that Jesus lived, died, rose again, is now ascended. What did that mean? What was the significance of that? Yeah, John? Sorry, John, John first. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, and I love the, and Ruth, what were you saying? Okay. What I love, and as you, as you look at the song they're singing, they're saying, this is the one who's worthy. It's not a lion, but it's this lamb. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed, you, you won back the people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. It's like, this is the way God is making things right in this world. And so they're singing out and they're rejoicing that the one who is worthy has come. That the one who, who can break the seals open and begin to make things right and begin to bring God's justice, he's now done what he needed to do and now he's beginning to make things right. So let me ask you this as we kind of, two questions as we kind of close this up. Again, scratching the surface on Revelation 5. When will these events from Revelation 5, when will they take place? We've already kind of given the answer away. Yeah, so, so they've already taken place where he's come into the throne room of God, he's ascended, and they're happening right now. So again, when we read Revelation, it's not only what's going to happen in the future, but what's going on right now. So that if that's true, that this is happening right at this very moment, what significance does this have for you in your life? What does this reality change for your life right now? Yeah, Jane. Yeah. Yeah, so the victory is ours. We have the victory in, in this Lamb, in, in Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. So being being aware, being ready for when he returns. Yeah. Any other? What does this matter for you that Christ is seated at the right hand of God right now? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we worship. That, that's a, a big part of our response is now we get to worship. And I, I've mentioned this before, and I'll say it again. When we worship, like today, you guys who worship this morning and those that are going to worship in just a few minutes, we're worshiping alongside them. Like we join in this. Like, this is the reality we get to join in on, even though we're here on earth, but this is what's going on right now. That's pretty, I think that's pretty cool. I think that's awesome. Yeah, Jeff, one more question. Or one. Yep. 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 No, there's a big part of our worship service, and it's more traditional. So if you guys go to the more traditional services, in our communion liturgy specifically, we have, you know, and I talked about it in the sermon, so you already, you already beat me to it, Jeff. Good. You aren't even here. Good job. We, we, you know, if you grew up Lutheran, the song, This is the Feast, you probably are like, yeah, yeah, man, I grew up with that. That's pulled, like, right from Revelation 5. And that's like all the verbiage, all the words are right from there. And Lamb of God who was slain, like all of that language is revelation language. And so we draw from that and we get to join in on that worship. So thank you guys for drinking from the fire hose this morning. You're probably going to be feeling that a lot over the next handful of weeks. If you did not get the overview. We're going to talk more about this next week, but you can start kind of reading through and kind of start being like, okay, how do I piece this all together? This is kind of a good structure overview of how to read the book of Revelation. If you didn't get one, let me know. Uh, if you want an online copy, email me, and I'll make sure to send you a digital copy too. All right? Thank you guys. Have a good rest of your day, and try and stay warm and not too snowy.